Let us pray. Dear Lord, we say thank you so much for teaching us about health. As we delve into our lecture for stewardship, may you give me the right utterances so that we all can be blessed as we listen to you. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. You can have your seats. Yesterday we discussed the topic the poor will always be with you. And we learned that the problems we are facing today is that a result of sin. And good enough, even the health lecture testified to that fact. We learned that the God, who's, the God that we serve our cares for the marginalized, the poor in our midst. And because we are his children, he also, it is his desire that we also care for the, uh, for the poor in our midst. And we said we should follow God's order when it comes to caring for the poor. We said, number one, we must have a relationship with Christ. Our first devotion to, should be towards Christ, like we saw Mary doing. And we said, we should also take care of our families, the families that God has given to us, so that, in the words of Paul, we are not considered as infidel. We said, because the poor will always be with us, we should take care of the poor in our midst and also those outside of the church. And we said, in doing these good things, we should have a good motive and not a selfish one. And we also learned that we shouldn't marginalize the poor in our midst in the name of warfare. And we said, though the disciples, beginning with Judas, called Mary's action a waste, but Christ saw it as a worship. And I said, there is nothing we do for God, be it our time, be it our talent, be it our treasure, there is nothing we do for God that is a waste. They are all meaningful in the sight of God. And we said, we should not use the poor as excuse for not doing what is right. We are to help the poor in our midst, outside of the church, in the communities that we live in, but we should not use our help to the poor as an excuse for not serving God, for not being faithful in our returns towards God. Because... And lastly, we learned that God will restore everything one day. And we said, at the second coming of Christ, we are promised that he is going to restore everything. No more sickness, no more death for eternity. Our key text today, as we read, is from Matthew. I want to read again. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, or who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. This is a passage that we all know. So today I want to discuss it from the, under the title, God's Insurance Policies. Can we repeat the topic? God's insurance policy. There are many biblical passages uh, informing us about how God cares about us, how a lot of insurances in the Bible. We, we, there are insurances on God's presence, 
that he, has, he, he, he will be near us, he will give us strength. Uh, there are insurances telling us that he will provide our needs. There are insurances promising us about the peace of God. There are insurances from the Bible uh, about the forgiveness and the redemption of the Father. Many, many passages in the Bible. But today my focus will be on two. But let's begin with insurance company. If you own a car, if you are a business owner, there is a high possibility that you are subscribing with one of the insurance companies in Kenya. And we all know that these insurance companies, obviously they are bis- uh, profit-oriented. Uh, they trust that your insured items will remain safe during the period that you insure them for. Uh, these companies also take risks because if you deposit three or 4,000 shillings per year for whatever thing that you want to insure, and within that year or within that period, uh, they, 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 there is a problem and they have to come in and pay maybe let's say 100,000 shillings, that means that they are going to pay more. So they also take risks in order to benefit from the insurance. Uh, The company will assist you in times of need as outlined in the agreement that you sign with the insurance company. Then let's look at us. Most of them people go into insurance because you you don't know the future. So well, let let, let me just insure my business so that just in case there uh, there is a fire incident, I can have some some money to to restart my business. Uh, let me insure my home just in case there is an accident. Let me insure my car. There is, there is, uh, uh, so if there is an accident, at least I am assured that something later will come to me to handle this or the insurance company will fix my car. Uh, but every agreement we go into, we know definitely that there is an expiration date that it would expire most often during a year period. So you, that means when the year comes to an end, you do not benefit from the money that you gave or you do not get your money back. So you don't go back to the insurance company and say, well, I deposited my money and throughout this year, my car was not involved in an accident, so I have come back for my money. Is that way it works? It does not work that way. So when we insure, it's like we are sharing just in case. Do you insure your car? Do we insure our businesses and even sometimes our homes? You hope to avoid any type of accidents. Are you following? So what are you doing in the North Shore? By doing so, you assist the insurance company in safeguarding your own possessions. You don't insure your car and you say, well, since my car is insured, I will intentionally rush into another car because my car is insured and the insurance company will come and handle uh, the damage. We, we don't do that. So even though you insure your properties, you are very mindful about how you handle them because you don't want to incur any harm for yourself. And obviously you make pay- payments based on the agreement. Now sometimes we go into insurance, there could be many reasons, but I have just two. Maybe it is a government uh, requirement that you must insure your car, you must insure your business. It is a requirement that you must do that. So because it is a legal or government uh, requirement, you do uh, insure your car. Sometimes you do because you don't know what the future holds, so you just want to be on the safe side. But today I want to share with us two insurance policies from God's word that we can depend on anytime, that we can look up to anytime. Today I'm going to be a little bit slow. I, I'm going to be a little bit, uh, I'm going to be a little bit slow because I want you to get a concept or an idea from the familiar text that you've been used to, which we quote often, especially when it comes to prayer. Now, we read in Matthew that Acts, and it shall be seek, and you shall find, and knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. 
What I want to do today, I want to transition a little bit into English language class. You see, obviously many of you may not have this skill because uh, I know your pastor do because uh, the senior pastor of this church, this is studying in New Testament, so he knows the Greek in which the New Testament was written in. Now, watch this. In English, for instance, we have what we refer to as the voices. Am I right? You know the voices? You have the passive and what? Talk to me if you can. You have the active verse and the passive verse. When a verb is an active verse, it means who is performing the action? The subject is the one performing the action. If it is in the passive verse, it means the action is being performed on the subject by another person. Also, like the Greek in English, we also have tenses. You have the past tense, you have the present, the future. We have tenses also in the Greek. Then there is something we call the mood. The mood is more about how the action is being done. Now we're going to look at that very quickly. Now when you read this text that we are used to, it says acts. Now, we know that acts is not a noun, but rather a verb. It is an action word. Commanding you or asking you to ask for something. Now, this verb, or this word, this verb, which is one of the insurance policies that we are looking at in the text, is in the present tense. If you will, you could say the present continuous tense. It is also an active verse. But the mood is an imperative. Now, what am I driving at? This is not an option for us as believers. Christ did not say when you are not okay, then ask. Uh, he did not say when you are not feeling too well, then you should ask. He did not say when you have eaten and you are full, ask. No, 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 no. This is an imperative. It means that as believers, the same way we obey the commandments of God, we must ask because we need to ask. It is an imperative. So when Christ told his disciples, ask, he was not giving them an option. It was an imperative. It was a command. That's why the verb, ask, is in the imperative. So as believers, we must what? Ask. It is in the imperative. And when you check the correspondence, it says, when you ask, what happens? You will be given. Now notice Given is in the future, which many of us worry about, which many of us think about, the reason why we insure our properties, our homes, our cars, is because we are thinking about the future. Now, Christ, who knows that we, we always think about the future, he gave us an insurance policy here that when we ask, when we do the action, when we are performing the action, he says that it will be given to you. Now, check up the, the voice. Is it in the active or passive? Given. Is it in the, what is the voice? It's a passive voice. That means when you ask, when you perform the action of asking, you will receive the action of what? Being given. Are you following? Are you getting my point? Now, your part, my part is to ask. The way it will be given, that's not my business. The time it will be given, that's not my business. But the insurance that I have is that when I do my part, when I ask, God has promised that he will definitely, it will definitely be given to me. Likewise, the verb seek. He says when you seek, you will find. Interestingly, why the verbs ask and knock are in the passive voice, meaning that when you knock, it will be open for you. When you ask, it will be given to you. But when it came to the word seek, the Bible says, it, when you seek, you will what? Find. Are you following? Does that communicate something to us? Yes, when I knock, it will be opened for me. When I ask, it will be given to me. 
But when I seek, when God gave me the ability to seek, I will be the same person who will find whatever I'm seeking. And that's why when you go to the other side, it says that whoever asks, will what? Receive. Whoever seeks, will find. Whoever knocks, it will be opened unto him. And interestingly, the mood for ask, seek, and knock is a participle. It's like uh, continuously doing something. Uh, th th let me say another way. Whoever is asking will be receiving. That's, 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 let, let me say it that way. Whoever is knocking, it will be opening. Whoever is seeking, he will be funding or she will be funding. That means as believers, we have learned previously that this is in the imperative mood. So we are to be asking the law every day. That's, that's the insurance policy that we have from God. That's, that's the assurance that we have when we ask he has promised that he will definitely give us what we are asking for. So what do we learn from this first insurance policy before I move to the next? What we learn from this is that when you ask, you believe. Now listen to the point. When you ask, you believe that there is someone who will answer. And that is the person that you are asking. Are you following? So every time I go to, I go to God in prayer, every time we pray to God, we are praying, believing that as, 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 while I am asking, there is someone, though I don't see him, but by faith, I believe that there is someone who is listening to me and who will definitely answer me. So, when you, when we, when you ask, when you believe, there is someone who will answer. And that is obviously the person that you are talking to. The, first, the next thing is, you seek and find when you recognize the value of what you lost or what you are searching for. Do you search for anything that is not valuable to you? When you are looking for something, when you are seeking something, it means that thing is valuable to you. So when you are praying about something, it means it is something that is valuable to you. And that is why God says, when you seek, you will, when, when you recognize the value of what you are seeking for, you will definitely find the thing. The third point is, you knock on the door because you trust that there is someone inside to open the door to you. Now, let, let, let's be a little bit practical. When you stand at the door and knock or and ring a bell, do you expect the door to open by itself? You are knocking because you could just have come and opened the door and enter. But you are knocking because you have that trust, that belief that there is someone behind the door who will open the door for you. Are you following? So that is the fit that we, we use in asking God. So he said, we, you, you knock on the door because you trust that Someone inside will open it for you. Similarly, when you know that there is a God who answers, who locates, who opens doors, who knows the future, and who cares about you, you will ask, you will seek, and you will knock. Isn't this an assurance from God? That when I, when, when I knock on this door, I know that someone is to the other side who will open it for me. That when I ask, I believe that my response will come. When, when I seek, I, I trust that he will give me the ability to find what exactly I'm in search of. Now let's go to the next insurance policy. It's something that we know, uh, the Malika that we use every now and again doing uh, tithe and offering, when, when we are lifting tithe and offering. God says, bring... The word bring again in the Hebrew is an active verse and interestingly, it is also in the imperative. That means this is not an option. God did not say, well, when you have too many things to handle, you don't, don't bother yourself. No, 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 no. It is an imperative. And I will tell you in a few minutes why I say so. He said, try me on this. Test me and see if I will not prove myself to you. So, when we 
bring, when we listen to the voice of God, what does he do? He opens for us those that we are not aware of. He pulls blessings down for us. He rebukes the devourers for our sake. He allows us to bear fruit. Now, we don't return talent offering to attract God's blessings. You know, that, that's a wrong concept. Many people think, well, when I paid my talent offering, when, when I'm faithful in church, it means I will attract God's blessing. No. Now, to pay a 10% of something, the implication is that you have 100%. Are you following? Are you following? If you are to pay tithe, which is 10%, it means that you have the 100%. That means you already have the blessing that the Lord has blessed you with before he even asks you to return. Because, by the way, you don't pay, you return tithe and offering because everything, as we learned a few days ago, that everything we own, including ourselves, belongs to God. So, if we refuse to be faithful to God, here are the implications. Number one, it means that we don't recognize that he provided what we have. We don't recognize that he is the one providing the things that we have. We don't recognize that he will be the one to provide the things that we will have. That's the implication because, well, I bless you, you must return. I am not going to return. The implication is that I don't trust that what I have was provided by God. The second implication is that we think God can change. And in the same passage, in verse 6, the Bible says, God told the people that I do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the, the second implication is that when we refuse to be faithful to God, we are indirectly telling God that you are a God who is not stable. You can change. You are not a stable God. The third implication is that we appreciate curses because God was def very definite in verse 9. If you are not faithful, you will be cursed. And I, I remember last year I told you that this curse is the blank check curse. We don't know what is in the curse. And the, 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 don't be afraid of this, but this is what God is saying. And when you study the context, it is an agriculture on the tomb. It has an agriculture on the tomb. And what, what do I mean by that? It has to do with harvesting, planting, waiting, harvesting. The next implication is that when we, don't, when we, when, when we are not faithful, it means that we don't trust God for provision. We are our own God. What we, imp what we say in the nutshell is that, well, Lord, I, I don't care about what you say because I can provide for myself. And we know that it doesn't work that way. The next implication is that we don't need his word. Now, what is the point? Um, come to think of this. Uh, we, the leadership speaker is speaking from the book of Nehemiah. And I found something very interesting in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13, verse 10 down to 14. Nehemiah observed that the priests who came back from captivity, they left their works as priests and they went in the field and began to make farms for themselves so that they could have something to eat. And when Nehemiah was talking, he told the people that the priests left their jobs because no food was in the storehouse. So they, 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 you, 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 we cannot hold them responsible in a nutshell. So Jer uh, Nehemiah was telling the people that you refuse to be faithful to God and that is why the priests have left their job who's supposed to be serving you in the uh, for your religious life. They have left their job and they have gone in the field to farm food for themselves. Now what, is, what am I saying in a nutshell? Every Sabbath, we have ministers who's, who come and stand behind the sacred desk to encourage us, to rebuke us, to instruct us, to teach us. Now, God, who is all wise, use this means to provide their own means of living. Now, if I refuse to be faithful in my tithe, but I want to come to church and listen to their rebuke, listen to their instruction, listen to their correction for my salvation, it means I'm not being fair to myself. Are you, are you getting the logic I'm trying to push? So if we refuse to pay, to return our tithe and offering, to be faithful to God, in, not in a nutshell, we are telling God that we don't need your word, we don't need your ministers, we don't need them, we can survive by ourselves. And you and myself know that 
We need spiritual guidance. We need to be instructed every now and again. We need to be instructed. We need to be corrected. We need to be encouraged from the word of God. Even the program we are having this week, it is because you decided to be a blessing to the church. It is because you decided to return tithe and offering. And that is why we are being encouraged throughout this week. We are being admonished. We are being corrected, instructed. We are getting new lights or new information, powerful for our own spiritual life. Why? Because of what we did. So what is the implication or what are the lessons from this insurance? Number one is that you rob yourself when you attempt to rob God. Come to think of that. Number two, which God is able to open and close. That's what he told the Israelites. He's able to open those. He said, I will open the windows of heaven and pull down more blessings that you will not have room enough to receive it. Why? When you test, when you try me and see that I'm a faithful God. The third lesson is God's promises are sure. Because he's not a man to lie. Amen. So as I take my seat, here are the few things that I want us to take with us home. Number one, from the two insurance policies. The first is, unlike the insurance companies, the government or yourself, God owns everything. So we return not pay tithe or offerings. Are you following? Unlike the insurance companies. Number two, unlike the insurance companies, God does not force you to return. You do it voluntarily. Are you following? Were you threatening this fellowship if you did not come for the service today? No. You willfully walk into this place because you are hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how God operates with us. The third lesson is, God wants to bless us and not to benefit from us. Do you know where the employees of the, the insurance company get their salary from? It is from the money that we pay to them. I believe that those are people that have faith because they have the faith that all of the money that will be given to us, we have the faith that some will renew us and we will not use them for the customers or for the clients. Are you following? God wants to bless us and not to benefit from us. The next one is, we have assurance from God, not insurance. There's a difference between assurance and insurance. We have assurance from God. It is not a contract, but a covenant. And you know what a contract is? A contract is, when you do this, I will do this. If you fail to do A, I will not do B. But a covenant is, I will bless you anyhow. That's why when you read the covenant that God made with, with, with Noah, God was the one who made the covenant with Noah because he wanted to bless Noah and the children after him. God knows the future and he is faithful unlike the insurance companies, yourself or the government. God knows the future. The future that we, are, that, that we are so much afraid of. The future that we, we approach with uncertainties. God knows the future. Are we, are we secure in his hand? Definitely we are. The next point is, there is a guarantee of a blessing that you wish for, not just in case. Now, I said something previously that when people insure their properties, Though they have insured their properties, believing that, well, in case there is an accident, I will, be, I, will, I, I will get some compensations, they don't intentionally cause trouble for themselves. They still try to secure their properties. But for God, he has given us the guarantee of blessing. And his blessing is not just in case. His blessing are the one that woke us up this morning. The air in our nostril. The ability to sit in our cars and drive to church. The ability to eat and enjoy the food. The ability to come and sit in church and listen to his word being preached to you. His ability to encourage you. These are the blessings of God. The good help that you have. These are the blessings of God. 
God, there is a guarantee of a blessing that you wish for, not just in case. Just in, no, it is not just in case. God is always waiting to bless us. And lastly, you can trust this company. You can trust the, the director of this company because he is faithful. He's not a man. He does not lie. He's faithful. He's gracious. He pardons. He's faithful. So as I take my seat today, like I said, there are many promises from God's word. But what I want to say is that as we do these requirements based on law, based on constitution, based on government, we have the best insurance company. And this is not just an insurance company, but it is an insurance company. When you ask, God will give you. And he will give you the best. It could be a wait. It could be a no. It could be yes right now. When you seek, God will give you the ability to find the valuables that you are seeking. When you knock, you have the assurance that there is someone behind the door that I'm knocking who will open the door for me to enter in. And he also says that when we are faithful with the blessings that he has blessed us with, he has given us the assurance that he will protect us while we live in this world and with the guarantee that when he comes the second time, eternal life will be a blessing for all of us. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Let us please stand up as we pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word once again. You have spoken to us beginning with the man in the mirror. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for bringing us into existence. Thank you for the air that we breathe. Thank you for the food and the appetite that we have. Thank you for the good health. The privilege that we have to listen to you speak to us through these feeble lips of clay. Thank you for your numerous blessings. I pray, dear Lord, that you help us instead of putting our trust in men, to put our trust in you because you never disappoint. Bless us even as we proceed to the next program and as we go through this week smoothly. Until we meet again tomorrow, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May the Lord bless you to be heads and not tears. May the Lord bless you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen.